Lesson 11 Waging Love Sabbath Afternoon March 6 Good deeds are twice a blessing, benefiting both the giver and the receiver of the kindness. The consciousness of right doing is one of the best medicines for diseased bodies and minds. When the mind is free and happy from a sense of duty well done and the satisfaction of giving happiness to others, the cheering, uplifting influence brings new life to the whole being. Let the invalid, instead of constantly requiring sympathy, seek to impart it. Let the burden of your own weakness and sorrow and pain be cast upon the compassionate Savior. Open your heart to His love and let it flow out to others. Remember that all have trials hard to bear, temptations hard to resist, and you may do something to lighten these burdens. Express gratitude for the blessings you have. Show appreciation of the attentions you receive. Keep the heart full of the precious promises of God that you may bring forth from this treasure words that will be a comfort and strength to others. This will surround you with an atmosphere that will be helpful and uplifting. Let it be your aim to bless those around you, and you will find ways of being helpful both to the members of your own family and to others. The Ministry of Healing, pages 257 and 258. Read Isaiah 58, ye who claim to be children of the light. Especially do you read it again and again who have felt so reluctant to inconvenience yourselves by favoring the needy. You whose hearts and houses are too narrow to make a home for the homeless, read it. You who can see orphans and widows oppressed by the iron hand of poverty and bowed down by hard-hearted worldlings, read it. Are you afraid that an influence will be introduced into your family that will cost you more labor? Read it. Your fears may be groundless and a blessing may come, known and realized by you every day. But if otherwise, if extra labor is called for, you can draw upon one who has promised, Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily. The prophet is addressing Sabbath keepers, not sinners, not unbelievers, but those who make great pretensions to godliness. Our souls must expand. Then God will make them like a watered garden whose waters fail not. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, pages 35 and 36. The work of beneficence enjoined in Isaiah chapter 58 is the work that God requires His people to do at this time. It is a work of His own appointment. We are not left in doubt as to where the message applies and the time of its marked fulfillment. And the nearer we approach the end, the more urgent this work becomes. All who love God will show that they bear His sign by keeping His commandments. They are the restorers of paths to dwell in. This is the ministry which God's people are to carry forward at this time. This ministry, rightly performed, will bring rich blessings to the Church. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, pages 265 and 266. Sunday, March 7. Buy something free? Not by painful struggles or wearisome toil, not by gift or sacrifice is righteousness obtained, but it is freely given to every soul who hungers and thirsts to receive it. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat, without money and without price. Their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord, and this is his name whereby he shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 1, chapter 54, verse 17, and Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 6. No human agent can supply that which will satisfy the hunger and thirst of the soul. But Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, and John chapter 6, verse 35. 
As the weary traveler seeks the spring in the desert and finding it quenches his burning thirst, so will the Christian thirst for and obtain the pure water of life of which Christ is the fountain. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, pages 18 and 19. Salvation is a free gift, and yet it is to be bought and sold. In the market of which divine mercy has the management, the precious pearl is represented as being bought without money and without price. In this market, all may obtain the goods of heaven. The treasury of the jewels of truth is open to all. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, the Lord declares, and no man can shut it. No sword guards the way through this door. Voices from within and at the door say, Come. The Savior's voice earnestly and lovingly invites us, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich. Revelation chapter 3, verses 8 and 18. The gospel of Christ is a blessing that all may possess. The poorest are as well able as the richest to purchase salvation, for no amount of worldly wealth can secure it. It is obtained by willing obedience, by giving ourselves to Christ as his own purchased possession. We cannot earn salvation, but we are to seek for it with as much interest and perseverance as though we would abandon everything in the world for it. Christ's Object Lessons, pages 116 and 117. To live for self is to perish. Covetousness, the desire of benefit for self's sake, cuts the soul off from life. It is the spirit of Satan to get, to draw to self. It is the spirit of Christ to give, to sacrifice self for the good of others. There can be no self-seeking in the life of him who follows the Savior. The true Christian works unselfishly and untiringly for the Master. He does not seek ease or self-gratification, but holds all even life itself, subject to God's call. And to him are spoken the words, He that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Matthew chapter 10, verse 39. Our High Calling, page 287. Monday, March 8. High Thoughts and Ways. We do not understand the greatness and majesty of God, nor remember the immeasurable distance between the Creator and the creatures formed by His hand. He who sitteth in the heavens, swaying the scepter of the universe, does not judge according to our finite standard, nor reckon according to our computation. We are in error if we think that that which is great to us must be great to God, and that which is small to us must be small to Him. He would be no more exalted than ourselves if he possessed only the same faculties. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 337. Since the divine law is as sacred as God himself, only one equal with God could make atonement for its transgression. None but Christ could redeem fallen man from the curse of the law and bring him again into harmony with heaven. Christ would take upon himself the guilt and shame of sin, sin so offensive to a holy God that it must separate the Father and his Son. Christ would reach to the depths of misery to rescue the ruined race. Before the Father, he pleaded in the sinner's behalf, while the host of heaven awaited the result with an intensity of interest that words cannot express. Long continued was that mysterious communing, the Council of Peace, Zechariah chapter 6, verse 13, for the fallen sons of men. The plan of salvation had been laid before the creation of the earth, for Christ is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. Yet it was a struggle, even with the King of the universe, to yield up his Son to die for the guilty race. Oh, the mystery of redemption, the love of God for a world that did not love him. Who can know the depths of that love which passeth knowledge? Through endless ages, immortal minds seeking to comprehend the mystery of that incomprehensible love will wonder and adore. Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 63 and 64. 
The closer you come to Jesus, the more faulty you will appear in your own eyes, for your vision will be clearer and your imperfections will be seen in broad and distinct contrast to his perfect nature. But do not be discouraged. This is evidence that Satan's delusions have lost their power, that the vivifying influence of the Spirit of God is arousing you, and your indifference and unconcern are passing away. God does not deal with us as finite men deal with one another. His thoughts are thoughts of mercy, love, and tenderest compassion. He will abundantly pardon. He says, I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions. Look up, you who are tried, tempted, and discouraged. Look up. The hand of the infinite is reaching over the battlements of heaven to grasp yours in its strong embrace. The mighty helper is nigh to bless, lift up, and encourage the most erring, the most sinful, if they will look to him by faith. But the sinner must look up. Our High Calling, page 27. Tuesday, March 9. Fast Friends. On the Day of Atonement, Two kids of the goats were brought to the door of the tabernacle, and lots were cast upon them, one lot for the Lord, and the other lot for the scapegoat. The goat upon which the first lot fell was to be slain as a sin offering for the people, and the priest was to bring his blood within the veil and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions in all their sins. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions in all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat, and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities into a land not inhabited. Not until the goat had been thus sent away did the people regard themselves as freed from the burden of their sins. Every man was to afflict his soul while the work of atonement was going forward. All business was laid aside, and the whole congregation of Israel spent the day in solemn humiliation before God with prayer, fasting, and deep searching of heart. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 355 All God's gifts are to be used in blessing humanity, in relieving the suffering and the needy. We are to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to care for the widow and the fatherless, to minister to the distressed and downtrodden. God never meant that the widespread misery in the world should exist. He never meant that one man should have an abundance of the luxuries of life while the children of others should cry for bread. The means over and above the actual necessities of life are entrusted to man to do good, to bless humanity. The Lord says, Loose the bands of wickedness, undo the heavy burdens, let the oppressed go free, break every yoke, deal thy bread to the hungry, bring the poor that are cast out to thy house. When thou seest the naked, cover him, satisfy the afflicted soul. Isaiah chapter 58 verses 6, 7, and 10. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. These are the Lord's commands. Are the great body of professed Christians doing this work? Christ's Object Lessons, pages 370 and 371. Wednesday, March 10. Fast Fight. The fast which God can accept is to deal thy bread to the hungry and to bring the poor which are cast out to thy house. Wait not for them to come to you. The labor rests not on them to hunt you up and entreat of you a home for themselves. 
You are to search for them and bring them to your house. You are to draw out your soul after them. You are with one hand to reach up and by faith take hold of the mighty arm which brings salvation, while with the other hand of love you reach the oppressed and relieve them. It is impossible for you to fasten upon the arm of God with one hand while the other is employed in ministering to your own pleasure. If you engage in this work of mercy and love, will the work prove too hard for you? Will you fail and be crushed under the burden, and your family be deprived of your assistance and influence? Oh no, God has carefully removed all doubts upon this question by a pledge to you on condition of your obedience. This promise covers all that the most exacting, the most hesitating could crave. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily. Only believe that he is faithful that hath promised. God can renew the physical strength, and more, he says, he will do it. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, pages 34 and 35. Seize every opportunity to contribute to the happiness of those around you, sharing with them your affection. Words of kindness, looks of sympathy, expression of appreciation would to many a struggling lonely one be as a cup of cold water to a thirsty soul. A word of cheer, an act of kindness would go far to lighten the burdens that are resting heavily upon weary shoulders. It is in unselfish ministry that true happiness is found, and every word and deed of such service is recorded in the books of heaven as done to Christ. Live in the sunshine of Christ's love. Then your influence will bless the world. The spirit of unselfish labor for others gives depth, stability, and Christ-like loveliness to the character and brings peace and happiness to its possessor. Every duty performed Every sacrifice made in the name of Jesus brings an exceeding great reward. In the very act of duty, God speaks and gives His blessing. My Life Today, page 165 Jesus says, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. The love and sympathy which Jesus would have us give to others does not savor of sentimentalism, which is a snare to the soul. It is a love that is of heavenly extraction, which Jesus exemplifies by both precept and example. The love of Jesus is an active principle uniting heart with heart in bonds of Christian fellowship. Everyone who enters heaven will on earth have been perfected in love, for in heaven, the Redeemer and the redeemed will be objects of our interest. Sons and Daughters of God, page 147 Thursday, March 11 A Time for Us In the 58th chapter of Isaiah, the work of those who worship God, the Maker of the heavens and the earth, is specified. They that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places, Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. Isaiah chapter 58 verse 12 God's memorial, His seventh day Sabbath, will be uplifted. Thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, no longer trample it under your feet, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shalt honor him, I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Isaiah chapter 58, verses 12 to 14. Selected Messages, Book 2, page 106. The Sabbath is to be remembered and observed as the memorial of the Creator's work. Pointing to God as the maker of the heavens and the earth, it distinguishes the true God from all false gods. All who keep the seventh day signify by this act that they are worshippers of Jehovah. Thus the Sabbath is the sign of man's allegiance to God as long as there are any upon the earth to serve him. The fourth commandment is the only one of all the ten in which are found both the name and the title of the lawgiver. It is the only one that shows by whose authority the law is given. 
Thus it contains the seal of God affixed to his law as evidence of its authenticity and binding force. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 307. Should God forbid the sun to perform its office upon the Sabbath, cut off its genial rays from warming the earth and nourishing vegetation? Must the system of worlds stand still through that holy day? Should he command the brooks to stay from watering the fields and forests and bid the waves of the sea still their ceaseless ebbing and flowing? Must the wheat and corn stop growing and the ripening cluster defer its purple bloom? Must the trees and flowers put forth no bud nor blossom on the Sabbath? In such a case, men would miss the fruits of the earth and the blessings that make life desirable. Nature must continue her unvarying course. God could not for a moment stay his hand, or man would faint and die. And man also has a work to perform on this day. The necessities of life must be attended to. The sick must be cared for. The wants of the needy must be supplied. He will not be held guiltless who neglects to relieve suffering on the Sabbath. God's holy rest day was made for man, and acts of mercy are in perfect harmony with its intent. God does not desire his creatures to suffer an hour's pain that may be relieved upon the Sabbath or any other day. The Desire of Ages, pages 206 and 207. For further reading, My Life Today, Clothe the Naked, page 241, and My Life Today, one with God through faith, page 11.